Okay. Well, we'll go ahead and get started as people come in. Um, welcome, welcome to the Changemakers alumni panel. It's so exciting to be with you all as the semester is ending. Um, we thought this would be a really great opportunity to take some time to connect with some alum who have gone on to um, have really remarkable careers and are excited to have some insight from them on what a life with a humanities degree can look like. The program for tonight is once again being sponsored by the Peace Cities major as well as the honors program. So it's great to see Peace Cities and honors students here. Welcome. Um, all of our panelists here have been connected to honors or the Center for Peacemaking in some way or sort throughout their time at Marquette. So it's really great to have this community together here. Just some housekeeping, this is being recorded live streamed to YouTube so you can see the recording um, on the Center for Peacemaking's YouTube page afterwards if you wanna share it with anybody. There also is a chat feature ability. So throughout the presentation, if you have any questions that you would want um, the panelists to touch on, feel free to throw it into the chat. And we are allotting um, at least 20 minutes at the end of the program for there to be um, questions directly from you all, the students and um, panelists are excited to connect with you on that. But for now, um, I am going to start off this um, gathering with sharing a little bit about each panelist and have some questions prepared to um, start us off and then we'll get into audience questions like I shared. So um, once again, we have four great panelists with us and I'm going to start off with Sophia, Sophia Scorbe, um, who recently joined Marquette as the Assistant Director of the Honors Program. Before joining Marquette, she spent over three years at Legal Action in Wisconsin, the state's largest civil legal aid firm, advocating on behalf of low-income Wisconsin residents. At Legal Action, she practiced consumer and housing law, managed legal clinics in partnership with the Milwaukee Public Library, and worked with the Eviction Defense Project, a program that provides in-court representation for Milwaukee tenants facing eviction. She's a graduate of Wisconsin University of Wisconsin Law School and is excited to bring her advocacy to Marquette students seven years after she graduated with a BA in English Literature and Philosophy in 2014. So um, I have the first question prepared here is really thinking about the vast um, amount of vocational opportunities that a humanities degree provides students. And um, this first question I would like all the panelists to touch on, but we can start with you, Sophia, is how did you go about choosing your career path and prioritize your justice-driven values at the same time? First, thanks for that introduction, Parisa, and thanks everyone for joining in tonight. Um, in terms of choosing a career path, I grew up really attracted to reading and writing and telling stories, so I sort of felt like an English major before stepping foot on Marquette, to be honest. Um, but I also was interested in, in the law. And I didn't have any um, close contacts who were lawyers. I mean, none of my immediate family was lawyers. I didn't really know what lawyers did, to be honest. Uh, but I knew that I was interested in the concepts of our legal system, right, as like a driving force that impacts daily lives. Um, and also as not only impacting daily lives, but larger societal concepts like ethics and what what should and shouldn't be or what is and what is not. Um, and if those are even the goals of our legal system. So I think being attracted to those things um, certainly drove my interest um, to law school. And then I also knew lawyers could help people, right? So I knew about organizations like the ACLU where there are lawyers um, fighting for access to voting rights. And so I knew that I can, I can pair my interest in service and advocacy with my interest in law. So I knew there was a path for me and that sort of, um, that sort of led me to uh, pick law. And so I recently transitioned from law to helping students. So I feel like using my advocacy skills, working with students is sort of being part of that larger picture, but at a different and earlier stage perhaps in terms of working with students and their own discernment process and what careers they're thinking of. Um, and so that's helped me kind of keep my anchors of value-driven work at Marquette. Awesome, thanks, Sophia. Mallory, we can jump to you now. Um... 
I think you muted yourself or someone muted you. <laughs> I didn't mute myself. Thank you. <laughs> um, so we'll jump to Mallory now. Um, Mallory Daly is currently a graduate student studying investigative journalism, excuse me, investigative environmental journalism at University of Missouri Columbia. She worked as a reporting intern for St. Louis Public Radio State House Bureau as a associate producer for a religion news public radio show called Interfaith Voices, and was a host producer of a sustainable agriculture podcast. She currently is a operations assistant at a local community radio station and a state government reporter for the Columbia Missourian. Between those two jobs, she worked as a as an organic woman on a excuse me woman um, owned vegetable farm in Iowa and lived with a collective female farmers in El Salvador and also managed a postgraduate service program for the Sisters of Loretto. She uses her free time to turn her small backyard into a food forest and entertains daydreams of being a sustainable flower farmer, which sounds amazing. She graduated from Marquette in 2014 at, with a BA in writing intensive English and philosophy. We have a lot of philosophy um, alum on this panel, which is awesome to see. So um, Mallory, would you wanna answer the same question as well of how did you go about your career path and prioritize your justice-centered um, values at the same time? Sure. Um, and thanks for that introduction. I, um, if you can't tell from my bio, I have jumped around quite a bit <laughs> in my career and my interests and that like happened in undergrad as well. I remember my freshman year, like the ongoing joke, which a lot of parents like to say of like, um, so what are you majoring in this week? Like when you would call them on the weekends, that was definitely me. I um, have a hard time kind of settling down. And so journalism at this point in my life is like such a good fit because it allows me to kind of um, take in different topics every week, sometimes every day and um, learn about them. And that's something that I I really liked right out of college at the radio show. It was like every week we had a new topic to learn about. It was like a mini graduate course in a different world religion, um, which was really cool. But back to the question, um, I think that the versatility of a humanities degree is like a huge, huge strength. And um, when you graduate with a humanities degree, it's a little overwhelming sometimes to think about what are the things that you can do? Like, how do I make money off of all of these skills that I've learned in undergrad? And I definitely felt that kind of overwhelm. Um, not just like the first year out of college, but many years out of college. And so um, I just, you know, I knew that I wanted to do a profession that like felt meaningful to me and felt meaningful to my community, whatever community kind of meant. And that kind of like has morphed at different stages of my life. Um, but I wanted to, I knew I wanted to contribute to like an equitable and just society, but I didn't know how I wanted to do that. And so um, like Sophia, like I, always knew that I loved reading, writing, analyzing, editing, and became an English major at Marquette, added the philosophy degree as well. And um, I think just like following that interest and I've explored journalism, but I've also explored the nonprofit world, the international development world, but really like thinking about what kinds of skills can I offer to the movements that I feel particularly strongly about. Um, and then just receiving feedback from supervisors, mentors, friends, like along the way has helped me kind of um, whittle down and hone my skills and interests into a profession that now at this point, what, how many years ago was it when we graduated like, um, in 2014? Um, now I feel like I'm at a point where some things are converging in a nice nice way and I feel more of an affinity with kind of what my career path is looking like. So I guess I say all that just to um, show that it's okay to jump around and it's okay to not really be sure and um, but to like hold true to kind of the things that energize you and eventually you'll fall into the thing that feels good. Not to get too motivational speaker-ish. <laughs> 
sorry guys. No, yeah, thanks for that, Mally. Yeah, I changed my major three times when I was in Marquette. Um, changed my career path three times out of like four years out of college. And so, yeah, it's, it can be um, exciting too, you know, the, just the ability to move around and to learn. So thanks for sharing that. So our next speaker we have is Hari Prasad, who is currently a program associate with the Syrian Mapping Project at the Carter Center in Atlanta, Georgia, where he examines trends with the Syrian Civil War, by conducting a network analysis on armed groups. Hari graduated from Marquette in 2014 as well with a double major in international affairs and economics. He is a experienced researcher in Middle East and Southeast Asian politics and security with a demonstrated history of working in the think tank industry. He obtained a master's from George Washington University and previously served as a research assistant at the Hudson Institute and United States Institute of Peace, where he focused on topics that included economic growth, insurgencies, counterterrorism, and religious, poli religious politics in India. Hari, do you have some thoughts on this question as well? Yeah, so for me, it was always kind of simple because I've always been a really big nerd. So I just wanted a job where I can just sit in the corner all day and just be on the computer and read. And so far, I've been really, really lucky that's all worked worked out. Uh, I think it was really interesting because, like, working for, I mean, I was with the honors program, but I never actually graduated with the honors thing because uh, I did not meet all the requirements, which is great. I got all the benefits without having to do the kind of work things, which is, but I, it was just something for peacemaking. I'm here. And uh, during my time at Marquette, as well as like working for sort of peacemaking, it hope, open, helped open me up for like a lot of other opportunities. So, like, got to go to Palestine to teach English which get really started helping me build my international experience and like working with uh, professors like Risa Brooke and Michael Fleet way, way back in the day in the policy department also really helped just like get my research skills down and like figuring out like, okay, if I want to do research in think tanks, how does this exactly work? Uh, I think with DC is like when it became, it was really interesting because like DC is just its own very special unique beast when it comes to like policy stuff, which is even though I try to stay more on a scholarly side, it's all policy in DC. So I think my the kind of idea is like, okay, like of like what makes me comfortable, like what's up, what am I okay with? So like even because in general DC, like you're going to be working with people from like all across the spectrum, political spectrum on different things. And for me, it's like always choosing like, okay, who do I, who do I really trust? Where even if we disagree, I think we have like the same kind of principles and values guiding us, even if we like want to take different paths. So I think that's really been important in doing that as well as like usually like a lot of my I guess you could say mentorships or like former bosses where I really have close connections with is because like even when we disagreed, it's like they knew how to help me out when I when I needed to ask for help. I found a group, good group of friends to like keep around to keep around me who can like be supportive and help me. I think as much as like in professional stuff is important, like also knowing to have it who to have in your personal life has been like a really big driver of that. And yeah, I eventually found my way to Car Center, which really lines up with my values because of like our work as an NGO trying to bring peace and stuff like that. Not always successful, but like we try. So um, yeah, I guess that's the really short thing is like just more of making sure you know what your principle, in terms of like finding finding a just oriented path, just like know what your principles are and like who else shares the kind of principles with you. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. I've definitely seen that in my own life. I graduated from Marquette five years ago of how important it is, like who you surround yourself with and the values that those people carry as well. So thanks for sharing that, Hari. So our fourth panelist is Leah Tadlin, who is currently the New England Region Manager for Solutions Journals and Network, an independent nonprofit dedicated to rigorous reporting on the responses to social problems. She previously led this work in the Mountain West, including launching collaborative journalism projects between dozens of news organizations in Montana and New Mexico. She has been an education reporter for the Seattle Times and an education and local government reporter at the Casper Wyoming Star Tribune. Leah rep Leah's reporting has taken her to rural communities across the country and her writing has been widely published. She currently lives with her husband, two dogs, eight chickens and two ducks in Lebanon, New Hampshire and is rereading um, Dorothy Day's autobiography. She graduated from Marquette's Deidre College of Communications with majors in journalism and philosophy 
with a minor in political science in 2012. Leah, do you have thoughts on this question as well? Thank you so much. And I just have to say, this is the moment when one of those two dogs has decided to come over here and say hello. So we all get to sort of experience this together. This is our 10 month old puppy. So thank you for your patience with that and for the introduction. And I have to say, I am loving the philosophy major vibes in this room. And also Hari, definitely wanna talk with you about your experience looking at different religions in India. That was one of the projects I did with the Center for Peacemaking when I was at Marquette was looking at interreligious violence and nonviolence in India. So um, I would love to connect with you some other time about that. Okay. And also Patrick, how come I was never put on any of those projects when I was at Center for Peacemaking? <laughs> Maybe we can we can have an after party and talk about that one, Harvey. <laughs> and, and to your question, um, I have actually thought a lot about the reasons that drew me to journalism in the first place, and then the reasons why I stayed in journalism. And they really are two different sets of reasons when I am honest with myself about that. And initially, my reasons were a lot like Mallory's. I wanted a career that felt like much more than just a job, something that would allow me to continue meeting new people, learning new things about the world, seeing and understanding the world in new and deeper ways. And so all of that was and is totally true about journalism in my experience. Um, but I also, at a certain point, started to have a real in, inner conflict about whether or not um, my work as a journalist was sort of contributing to, you know, the arc of justice in the world or just kind of adding to the noise frankly. So um, I think we all, you know, can relate to the feeling of doom scrolling, right? There's even a, a word for that today where we just sort of become consumed by these really um, soul crushing barrage of negative news, persistently negative news all the time on social media, when we download a news podcast, when we watch the TV news. I mean, we either have this experience, I think, of being completely overstimulated, freaked out and anxious or totally numb, right? Like just glazed over, frozen. And so I, I started working five years ago for an organization that is really operating at trying to correct for that problem and solve for that problem of so much information and so much news today that really does not give society the information that it needs in order to improve and in order to self-correct, whatever those improvements or corrections may be. So I work for an organization now that um, thinks the news can be better and thinks that that sort of feedback loop that journalism provides to society where we're pointing out, you know, ways that society is going wrong. We can also be pointing out ways that society is doing it better when there's evidence to suggest that that's possible. So those are the kind of stories that, you know, over the last almost 10 years now, I've become more and more passionate about and more drawn to. Um, and the last thing I'll say, because I know that all our friends from the Center for Peacemaking are here, is that I have come to see journalism as a tool for peacemaking, that it can be done, that there is a very powerful connection and a really radical idea baked into journalism, you know, which is that you should know about and you should care about people whose life experiences are very different from your own, in your own community and farther away. And that, that is a radical idea. And journalism, when it's done really well, can humanize people so that you know and you see the life experiences of people who are very different from you. And you know, one of the things I learned at the Center for Peacemaking is that if you know someone, you cannot hate them. You might disagree, you might not like their life choices or their decisions, but you cannot hate them. So those, those are the, the ways that I see kind of a through line from you know, where I began to where I am now, really informed by uh, my time at Marquette. Thanks so much, Leah. So the next question that I have is thinking back on your time at Marquette, um, how did your Marquette experience the different organizations you were involved with, whether it was the honors program, Center for Peacemaking, um, your classes, your mentors, faculty, how did that experience shape and prepare you for your career journey? And Sophia, if we want to start back with you. Sure. So um, I think the honors program really did serve as an anchor for me as a student, um, particularly coming from outside of the Midwest. I was largely raised in Miami. And so coming into an institution where 
the culture was so different than what I was used to. I grew up in a very Latin family in a very Latin environment. So moving to, to Marquette was pretty overwhelming. Um, and so having a student group that I can, you know, call my base and, and really attach to in that way made me feel a little more confident in taking other risks and taking other opportunities, getting to know the city of Milwaukee through internships. Um, and my, you know, my academic advisor, who was John Sue at the time, I remember talking to him about majoring in English and wanting to go to law school. And I remember asking him, what's like, what's the path to law school? Like, what, is there a path? Like, what's the pre-law path? Cause I don't, I don't necessarily think I'm on it. Um, and he was very honest with me and said, this, it, this is your, this is the path for you. Like, this is the perfect path because it's the path that you want to take. Um, and just having an advisor that made me feel empowered in my academic choices at Marquette was so crucial to me because again, I didn't know any lawyers. And so I wasn't sure if I had to major in poli sci or criminology studies or, you know, what, where do I go? And um, a lot of grad schools and law school in particular, they accept all sorts of majors. And I didn't know that going in. Um, so I, you know, he, he urged me to think about what am I compelled to? What challenges me enough, but what doesn't feel super overwhelming where I feel like I'm putting another, some, someone else's vision of what's the perfect path for me. Um, and as uh, Mallory stated, I also picked up philosophy as a double major, not thinking I would do that, but just because I connected with the courses um, and, and with a professor in particular, I, um, and she's still a professor. So Teresa Tobin was one of my philosophy professors. And I remember having sort of a full circle moment years later um, where, you know, I was practicing eviction defense law and she and I met up for a coffee at a local Stone Creek and just talked about the work we were doing and how it overlapped. Like there were similarities and what, you know, she was working with incarcerated um, women in Milwaukee and I was working with um, tenants in Milwaukee. And I just remember thinking this, this is one of the benefits of being in a student oriented and a student led program like the honors program was feeling like my professors were more readily accessible to me in that way. And then staying engaged with them such that we can have a coffee later on. <laughs> so it sort of felt a little um, surreal to me, but um, that's just one example. And then again, I think it's been said, but mentorship, I think mentors are crucial. Um, and I had a good academic advisor, but looking back, I wish maybe I did have more mentorship or maybe I had that I had sought out mentorship or that mentorship was available to me um, in different areas. But those are so, some of the, the um, experiences at Marquette that definitely helped me on my journey. Thanks for sharing, Sophia. Mallory? Yeah, um, I resonate a lot with what Sophia said and um, just kind of want to add more broadly that I think that participating in projects at the Center for Peacemaking, being in the honors program, and then also having this humanities degree on top of that. Um, and, and just like the pretty like supportive network that those kind of, um, those uh, communities provided for my entire Marquette experience really taught me to be like a critical thinker. And it also allowed me to be like exposed to worldviews that um, you can't find just like in a classroom or it's a little bit harder to find them in a classroom. Um, and I think that those two things, like being a critical thinker, being able to analyze texts, being able to analyze media, being able to edit and write about things that are going on um, around me, just have really carries me so far in the work that I'm trying to do today. Um, and I think too, with the alternative worldviews thing, it just really um, enhances like not only my professional life, but also like just who I am as a person to have been exposed to that diversity in thought and um, in different lifestyles and um, different philosophies, different types of relating to the world. And so those are really broad kind of general examples, but I think that the the types of um, 
like readings and discussion questions and whatnot that are coming up in your classes and that are coming up in meetings through the Center for Peacemaking or in your honor seminars, like those really do translate into um, like ways to be in the world after college that um, are just so valuable. And so I think that, you know, that's a, that's a big picture look at um, the answer to this question for me. Thanks, Mallory. Hari? All right. Yeah, uh, Margaret was helpful in a couple of different ways. So uh, when I was with the honors program, actually like the one thing with the honors program is really good at like kind of creating like a tight knit community very early on. So like, I think like in general, like me first coming to college, I felt like completely lost of like, I don't know what's happening and I guess we're going with full. So I think honor program really helped with that. And then like the one thing I really appreciate about Marquette like is even though like, I guess you can have like the stereotype of like, oh, it's in the Midwest, kind of in the middle of nowhere compared to like big places like Harvard or whatever like that, you know, Marquette's better than Harvard. But um, uh, but I think like also like, kind of realizing going on, it's like, oh, wow, like if you look at like all like the faculty here or even like a lot of the uh, faculty, different people working here, like is how di actually diverse and like how much has been done, like where like, okay, like uh, like for, for instance, pre Professor Brooks was like a really well-known well -known professor in her field. Like she was a top person in like civil military relations. Other people have done work with the government or had done work with other different things. Or uh, or I know like in the case for some peacemaking, like uh, while I was focusing the program in, in Milwaukee, like Patrick had gone to Afghanistan a couple of times and it was like, going, oh my God, like you guys, we have like a lot of, for me doing international relations, like we have like a lot of international policy experience just in this small campus. So I think like also just making those kind of connections of like, I became close to a couple of different professors who, well, I can't do it every single day because I think that would annoy them, but like I was able to go into their office just to like casually chat, chat about stuff or like get their opinions on things, which is great. And they could talk about their experiences. And I know for me, when I, the job I had with Center for Peacemaking was like a huge shift for me because like I said, like I'm usually off in a corner reading a book or something like that versus like, oh, you have to go in front of like high school kids and teach which is utterly terrifying for me. And like, I know as a high schooler, I was very unruly. So I was like, yeah, I'd, it was hard. I think it was definitely a hard grow, growing problem, but like it really helped me adjust to uh, a lot of things for like other career things. Cause even if I'm not dealing with like an unruly kid that I have to teach, I have to deal with unruly adults who, are, who I'm working with sometimes. And also like um, using the teaching experience, I got that I was able to go overseas. So like, like I said, to Palestine and to a lot of other places to like say, oh, like I have experience teaching in Milwaukee. So. Um, that's some of the ways like market really helped prepare me for stuff. Thanks, Hari. Yeah, it's it's pretty cool. We've expanded that PeaceWorks program. We have uh, many students from all different disciplines teaching um, probably similar curriculum, a little revised from when you were teaching it, but it's cool to see how that's been able to then carry it on. Thanks, Hari. Leah? Yeah, these are all such thoughtful answers and I'm like really, just delighting and being able to think back to my my four years at Marquette. And this is like bringing back a lot of memories. So there are so many, but the, the few that I thought of, you know, in addition to just living in the city of Milwaukee, right in the heart of it all and taking, as I'm sure many of you did, like long walks, lot, spending days in the city, um, working with different organizations and really seeing every different part of that city. Um, and in addition to playing on the women's club ultimate Frisbee team, which just taught me a lot about life while I was at Marquette, there were a couple of specific, specific experiences I wanted to mention. And the one was the service learning floor that just had launched when I was on campus as a sophomore. And I'm not sure if it's still going on, but this was the, the Dorothy Day service learning community. Um, and it, it just completely changed the way that I think about what it means to be a person of service and was the first time that acts of service really moved. And I'm gonna be really honest here from like a task and a project and a sense of accomplishment to something very different and something that was much more being in relationship with the people around me. And I, I still, to this day, am working on those same lessons that I first learned um, through that program at Marquette. The Center for Peacemaking was obviously, like I mentioned, very influential, not just for the grant that, that supported uh, the very first kind of backpack journalism, multimedia storytelling project that I was able to do when I was a junior studying abroad in India, that was huge for me. 
Um, it also introduced me to meditation, which has been a, a very key practice for me to sort of find some refuge and sanity in the last, especially the last year. You know, I don't know about all of you during the pandemic. Um, Milwaukee Neighborhood News Service, I also want to give a shout out to. They were just getting going when I was there. I wrote one story for them and wish I could have done so much more with them. I hear they're doing amazing things nowadays. And then, like others have mentioned, I did have special connections with just a handful of professors. I had two journalism professors who were very influential um, for me, one of whom took a very stressed out phone call from me when I was trying to decide between two jobs a couple of months after graduation. So um, those two professors were uh, Pamela Nettleton and Danielle Beverly. And then uh, similar to the, the philosophy majors in the room, Melissa Shu was a big influence on my thinking and I just took every class I could with her and her philosophy degrees, her philosophy classes. Awesome, thank you. So this question is specifically for Mallory and Sophia. A lot of Marquette students, um, as they approach graduation, consider pursuing graduate or professional schooling. I'm curious what tips you have for students on how they can best prepare themselves for that experience. And we can start off with Sophia. Yeah, and I think it's nice because I went straight through to, uh, to grad school and, and uh, Mallory took some time off. So I think getting both perspectives will be really um, interesting. So I think one of the most important things that um, students should think of is the investment that they're making, right? So when I chose to go to law school after Marquette, um, I knew it would be a big investment on my part. And I'm not just talking about financial, you know, the financial investment um, portion of it, which is so, you know, that could be another hour of talking, I think, in terms of um, financing um, these, these next sort of career steps, but the energy, time, right? I mean, this is, you know, it's a huge investment. And so what I did was I visited um, Madison where the University of Wisconsin Law School was. I got to know a few people on campus before making that decision. Um, and once I was in law school, it's sort of, it was all consuming, right? I mean, it's a whole, again, a whole new culture of, of, how, of learning and, um, and expectations. And so um, at the time, looking back, what I wish I had done, although it worked out really well for me and I sort of, you know, thrived in law school, but it was also very challenging and stressful. And I, you know, looking back, I wish I had talked to a Marquette law student and gotten a coffee with them, right? And said, by the way, how's law school really? Like, <laughs> what sort of, what sort of courses do you take? And also, like, how do you study? Because it's, it's different, right? It's a different, um, at least, you know, law school specifically, I think um, there are a few perspectives in, in different schools, but it was a, it was a different sort of modality for everything. Um, and so, Looking back, I wish I had connected with um, with current law students more. But again, I didn't have that access. I didn't feel like I had those resources to me um, because I didn't know anyone who was um, who was going through that process. And that's part of I think meaningful mentorship. And I think you know students hopefully can find that on campus. Um, I certainly uh, you know try to. Um, help students who are interested in law school and kind of, you know, from a very honest and transparent perspective, right? And I think that's a big part of it too, is when you go to um, uh, an orientation or, you know, a, an info session, you might get perspectives, but how honest are they? Um, I think that, that, you know, the more honest you can be with others, the more equipped they'll be. And I think it's a win-win situation. Um, and then in terms of the financial aspect of it, I think looking back, I, you know, I wasn't sure about that landscape. And certainly I knew I wanted to end up in the nonprofit field and practice um, nonprofit law for a while. And so I didn't know what that looked like in terms of the financial investment I could make and what was available to me. Um, you know, there are huge pay disparities in every field and particularly in the legal field. Um, and so in terms of what type of law you do and in terms of being a woman too. And so there were, you know, many considerations that I kind of had to juggle. Um, and so 
financial mentorship would have been, I think, helpful. Um, I was able to um, get a fellowship and that's that's how I chose. That's one of the biggest factors of how I chose to go to law school in Madison and, um, and with that decide to kind of spend the next three years of my life in Wisconsin and work for the, the you know, my local community, which was a, a privilege to, to be able to sort of, you know, come to the Midwest, study here, and then also um, work with, with the local community. So I feel very um, honored to be part of that work. But but yeah, I think there are definitely resources out there. And I think it's about connecting with people that can help nav- you know, navigate that system with you. And um, alternatively, there's fellowships that aren't attached to schools necessarily as well that are available for students. And I think Marquette um, has been cultivating more of that, um, more of those opportunities. So, um, so yeah, that's what, that's what I would give the students now. Thank you, Sophia. Yeah, that honesty is so important. I also was interested in going to law school and speaking with people about informational interviews I found have been like so helpful throughout my life um, of just like really getting honest feedback from um, people in that profession. So thanks for sharing. Mallory? Yeah, so um, like Sophia said, I think I had six years, so maybe seven in between undergraduate and grad school. So I remember starting on my graduate school applications and just being like, what have I done? I have to get back into, I wasn't working in journalism at the time. So I was like, I have to get back into writing mode. I have to reach back out to my professors that I, some I hadn't talked to in several years, even though I, you know, tried to keep in touch hard after you leave. Um, And so my first a uh, word of advice would be stay in touch with your professors. They want to know what you're doing after college and you want to maintain that conne- connection and build that relationship so that um, when you are debating like whether or not you want to go back to school and maybe you need a recommendation, you can reach back out to them and, and um, it's not like, you know, coming out of the blue, which I think professors are very understanding, right? They know that like their students have a lot going on after college and no one responded to me with a grudge or anything like that. Everyone was very gracious and glad to hear from me, but I personally wish that I would have put more time into those relationships. Um, you know, even five years after college, just telling people where I am in the country and what kind of work I'm doing. Um, So that was one of my tips. And then another is, you know, while your coursework is on your brain right now, make sure that you set aside your favorite writing samples, your favorite research projects, your favorite cover letters you've written for internships, put them in a folder, make that folder easily accessible so that when you're either applying to graduate school or jobs in the future, you can pull things that um, you really like that you've already created. And so the whole application process feels a little bit less daunting. And for um, graduate schools where like journalism, where you need to submit clips, um, just make sure you have all of those easily accessible so that you don't have to give yourself more work when you open the application and see how long it is. <laughs> um, Another thing I wanted to mention was um, to really use the resources you have at your disposal at Marquette. So um, I'm guessing the Career Center and the Writing Center are still on campus. And those are really awesome resources to kind of hone your professional writing style so that even if you're like not quite sure if you want to go to grad school, you could maybe like um, write up a, what is it called, a personal statement. and have someone at the writing center, the career center, look it over for you and and give you feedback on that or your peers or your professors or mentors um, would be great resources there. And then um, another thing too is like, don't be afraid to um, work for a little while before going to grad school. If you're not quite sure, like I was pretty sure that whatever I wanted to do would um, benefit from me going back to school. And I wasn't exactly sure what that would be. And so I worked for six years in different capacities to kind of try and figure it out. Um, A couple of those years were spent doing postgraduate service, which is a great way to kind of um, figure out what you want to do if you're willing to live on that stipend lifestyle for a year in community. Um, 
I ran a program through the Sisters of Loretto that was a year that um, offered a year of postgraduate service. So I would be happy to answer questions about doing it or also kind of like the operations side of it as well. Um, but there are a lot of graduate schools. Uh, a lot of Jesuit schools offer scholarships and assistantships to folks who have done a year of service. Um, so that's one way to kind of finance that next step if you really want to. And um, there, there's some like loan forgiveness programs as well. Um, we, can, we can get into that on a one-on-one -on -one basis if you really want to tap into my knowledge in those areas. Um, and then the only other thing what did I have written down? Yeah, I, th I think that, that that about covers it, but just, you know, don't get curious and, and don't be afraid to kind of um, work for a few years or do a year of service and then jump back into grad school. It's not as hard as people make it seem like it's, it was difficult for me to kind of change course and, and say, okay, I'm going to, after being a professional for six years, I'm going to go back and, and be a student again. Um, but it feels really natural. It feels like a really good step for me. So um, it might be the same for you in six years. Who knows? Thanks for sharing, Mallory. Yeah, I took four years off. Um, it took me four years to go back to grad school, which I just started. And I definitely recommend it of working and really getting that experience under your belt. You learn so much about yourself um, and can help you really clarify the purpose of even pursuing graduate work. So thank you for that. So Hari, I'm gonna move over to you. Um, you have had a diverse range of experiences conducting research with think tanks. I see that there's a question in the chat that we can get to about think tanks, um, specifically on the East Coast, including Washington, DC. We have a lot of students who are interested in the DC area. So I'm curious, what advice do you have for students who are specifically interested in international peacemaking work, um, similar to what you've done, looking for work in the DC area upon graduation? Yeah, definitely. Um, I think one of the helpful things about DC is just because of the way it is, you can, there's like a lot of free services. You can, so if you're looking for a job, internship, or just events to attend to, there's like a, a wide range of like newsletters to that you can subscribe to. So for me, when I first got to DC, it was kind of like, it was a completely, well, almost completely new city to me. I didn't really know anybody. I was like, and I was like entered as a grad student. And since I'm, one thing I learned as a master's student, you don't really live on campus like you would do for undergrads. Like, oh, I'm living halfway across the city away from everybody else. So I think like just signing up for those newsletters, but also kind of just getting into the think tank scene, like, uh, I just kind of started applying and got finally got into one one and definitely like the interview that I did for that was not the typical interview you'd normally do because I guess she had already chosen me and it was more of like a okay I'm going to choose and I just made a joke and she really liked it um but um but no like one thing like both Mal and Sophia kind of mentioned like one talk to your mentors like a lot of people here whether it be for me like in the poli sci department a lot of them do have connections to DC or like they know people in DC they can definitely hook you up and like especially in DC, it, it's all about networking or like, so if you see someone like who maybe you're interested in a job or just want to learn about the career path, just send them an email saying like, Hey, can we meet up for a coffee? And the best part, because of COVID zoom is becoming so much easier to do. It's like, Oh, like we'll just do zoom instead back when, back when I graduated from, from Marquez, like before zoom was really a thing, really a thing. It's like, Oh, you have to go meet the pers person in person. Cause that's what they kind of expected or have like a really awkward phone call with them. But yeah, it's, it's really nice. Like there's, a, um, because I, I was telling them, like, if you're going to do, like, any information review, whether it be for the Hill, whether it be for think tanks, you're just getting an idea of, like, oh, what's your work like? What skills do you think is important? And what's your opinion on this? They might be either really, really nice, and they're just like, oh, I'm happy to help someone young. If they're really egotistical by reaching out to them, you're feeding their ego and think, making them think they're important. So that also helps out. So it's like a win-win either way. It's a win-win either way. Um, what was the other things I had? I should, have, I should have taken notes, but I'm not prepared like that. So, um, um but I think, like, also for me, like best you kind of go into research and like, this is something I kind of learned uh, slowly, gradually is like one, like be open to like new possibilities. So like for my job with the car center, I'm doing stuff I never learned about school. So like I'm using, I'm learning how to make maps. I'm learning how to do a lot of data collection in a way that they don't really teach you in that. And at first like, when I was applying for the job, I was really scared because they're going, oh man, I don't know how to use uh, like 
Power BI, I don't know how to use ArcGIS. I don't know how to make maps. I didn't do anything like that. I was afraid of going, oh, I'm not going to get this job because like I don't have any of the technical skills. But a lot of jobs, they actually just do the training for you. And I did a good enough job in the interview process. Like, oh yeah, we'll just train you, no problem. And just kind of want exploring that new type of these new type of avenues for research. Cause kind I of think like especially with the internet and all this stuff, it's opened up a lot of new avenues for research, whether it be for like human rights law or not, well, human rights and stuff like that in a ways that we didn't have access to before, which people are still only learning really how to use it. So like kind of one meeting with people looking for new avenues and also figure out like what exactly you're interested in. Because like, so like I could tell you like, okay, I work on Syria, but here's like a specific topic that people at work will come in Ask me about because that's the stuff I specialize I specialize on, and I think that's been like at least for a lot of people in the think tank world, like they all have their own like kind of niche too. Like, okay, we can do like general work, but like here's the things you really want to know. This is what we bring to the table. Yeah, thanks, Hari. I remember the first job that I had out of college. They were like, "Oh, do you know how to work with ArcGIS?" And I googled it really fast. I'm like, "Yeah, sure." And you just like learn. And it's cool to see that now Mark Head is actually having a lot of classes around data mapping, collection, um, both in the criminology um, department as well as like having its own department around data science. And so it's cool to see that students even have more access to learn about a lot of these critical systems that employers are now looking for. And I know that the classes for the students on the call aren't always the most fun or exciting, um, but it is like something that employers are really looking for. I know that like my um, supervisor out of college expected me to know and I had to very quickly teach myself. Um, so it is cool to see that like Marquette is um, providing access to those softwares um, when you're in college so that you can carry it on into the workplace. Thanks, Hari. Leah, I'm going to jump over to you now. Um, you have served as a journalist all over the U.S., um, which sounds so cool, from Wyoming to New Mexico, Montana, Seattle, and now New Hampshire. I'm curious how your interest has evolved as you've traveled the country and have been exposed to various types of journalism. That is such a good question, and I have really enjoyed reflecting and you know really thinking about what I want to say um, in response to this. So. The first thing I'll say is that I've learned a lot, like a lot, a lot, um, mostly about how much I don't know about this country, about the different cultures within this country, and just the incredible diversity of human experience that exists here. So I have learned so, so much and also realized, you know, the in infinity of how much I, I just can't know and, and don't know because of the limited kind of like slice of life that I have. But I can say that it, it, it's very different reporting from one community to the next, at least that was my experience. So in Wyoming, you know, it's very like single-minded, particular, like strong culture kind of place where um, some of you may know the state's finances are heavily driven by a hundred years of extractive coal and oil and gas industry. And they've paid that state's taxes for a very long time. And so I would, you know, drive to the newsroom every day past an old oil field and past a sign with an eagle and an American flag and a tagline that said, oil and gas pay your taxes. So I moved from that kind of community where my first two journalism jobs were to Seattle, where I was an education reporter. And there were these extremely activist and highly empowered high school students who were staging walkouts from their classrooms over their parents' failure to address climate change. And so the sort of change from place to place was very dramatic. And then in New Mexico, you know, where there are dozens of federally recognized tribal nations that have lived for more than a thousand years in that land that are still thriving and still existing today and that have real political power in the, in the state legislature there. I mean, I, I was, was able to sit with community leaders who, um, you know, shared a little bit about how their culture persisted, you know, against some really serious threats. And so just the, the different experiences of kind of being a reporter and a person of, um, a person of curiosity and really genuine interest, I think kind of cultivated um, in me this sense of like, just infinite learning, constantly learning. But in terms of professionally, what changed for me in terms of your question, I think there were kind of two things. 
And one was that, at least in journalism as I knew it, and Mallory, I'm cert certainly interested in your experience, um, there's this real competitive nature, you know? And maybe there's in Sophia and Hari's fields too, like you feel this, there's like a drive to push young, ambitious people into higher, bigger, better journalism jobs. And what you should do is like win as many awards as you can and then get out of your small town as fast as possible into a big urban news organization, which is where primarily, you know, the, the biggies are kind of located. And so I was certainly obsessed with that in my first couple of years out of college, but I eventually kind of started to feel pulled back to rural communities, which is where I grew up. And, and started to feel real uncomfortable with that as the defined path of success. And so I started you know, challenging those ideas of what success would look like for myself professionally and, um, and, and really started to think about what it would mean to be a person in the community that you're reporting on and figured out that it really changes for me the way I show up as a journalist and also as a person in the community when I'm rooted in a place. And then the second shift that I'll mention was that I made a pivot about four years ago from a straight reporting role into more of a coaching and support role at this journalism support organization that I work for now. And I just found that that opened up a huge part of myself that I wasn't really able to um, express in my role as a, as a very objective, neutral third party observer, you know, which is the role of a journalist. And so now in my sort of coaching role, um, I feel like I can sort of express the stubborn optimism that I really do feel about the world. Um, and I, so I'm sort of owning that in journalism, uh, which um, you know, is a, a, an industry filled with a lot of very cynical people, you know, and for good reason, because they've seen a lot of times the real darkness and the bad things that go on in this world, right? So I sort of have wrestled over the last couple of years, like, you know, am I too optimistic to be in journalism? And then I think, do I want to work in a field that sort of drives out all of the optimists? Do I want to work in that industry? No. So, you know, I've, I've stayed and I think have become much more confident and, and just honest, you know, about bringing my ideas of, um, you know, truly believing that in many cases things can improve into my day to day. Thank you, Leah. At this point, we are going to transition over to the student questions. I see that there's some in the chat. Thank you so much for submitting them. We also had some emailed to me um, prior to the gathering today. So I'm going to start off with one of Jamal's questions that they submitted. Um, and Mallory, this is specifically for you. Jamal's interested in what um, sustainable farming is. So if you could share a little bit more on what that type of work looks like um, and why it interests you. Sure. Um, that is such a, a good question and such a big question. Sustainable farming looks like a lot of different things. Um, my partner here in the city of Columbia, Missouri, is an urban farmer. So that's that's one way that sustainable farming um, plays out. And I know there are some excellent urban farms in Milwaukee as well. And I'm sure lots of folks on this call are already familiar with. Um, there are a whole host of practices that some um, people would kind of uh, describe as sustainable farming practices, um, but most, mostly people just talk about uh, creating a regenerative system that grows food that doesn't deplete resources. So it is um, making sure that it's you know not using up all of the water in a certain area or making sure that um, the livestock that are raised in a particular farm are not polluting nearby waterways or barns that aren't casting out emissions that are affecting the health of the surrounding neighbors. So there's a lot of different um, different practices that go with sustainable farming. And honestly, there's so many different definitions, like every NGO has a different definition, it seems like for sustainable farming. And now there's something called regenerative farming, um, which is incorporating more in traditional indigenous practices in how we grow our own food. So um, there's, a, there's a lot to explore there and a lot of it gets political very, very quickly. So um, definitely if, if it's something you're interested in exploring, like just dig in and um, 
figure out kind of which, which niche is, is the most interesting to you. Cool, thanks Mallory, that was really insightful. Sophia, Alyssa is asking, what made you decide to move from legal aid to Marquette's honors program? And thanks for that question. That's also a great question. Um, I think a few factors led to that transition and some of them I sort of saw coming and some of them popped up sort of organically. So um, legal action was the first professional job I got with, you know, out of law school and, and with my um, law license. And it was such a privilege to work there. I, you know, I'd been a few years in and working with low-income residents in Wisconsin, particularly in, in Milwaukee County, um, that couldn't afford a lawyer for things like applying to food stamps and being rejected or domestic violence issues or housing uh, where they weren't afforded a lawyer automatically under the law. And so, and I think that's also something that I learned right away in law school that you don't really think about as, you know, um, as sort of just a resident. Um, so, so I was doing that work and then I was doing the particular work of helping run the eviction defense project. So not only was I, and I think this is, um, the experience in many people's nonprofits um, experiences, right? You wear a lot of hats. So not only was I um, representing people in court uh, who were facing eviction, but I was training volunteers and training law students and, um, you know, um, presenting to the city to get them to, you know, fund us and, um, you know, uh, sort of helping, uh, collaborating with other researchers and data mapping um, this eviction, right? To sort of, um, push uh, impact litigation into the root causes of, of eviction here. And so I was wearing many hats and then, and the work fulfilled me so much, but then, you know, as, as sort of the, the story goes in the nonprofit field, and I think there's much work to be done in this issue is the under-resourced nature of a lot of nonprofit work. And so I was finding myself in court a lot um, when I wasn't planning to go to court and the secondhand emotional trauma of this type of work. And again, I think, you know, people on this call can maybe um, relate to as well, but just the, the trauma of, of seeing people being ripped from one of their most, um, crucial safety nets, their home, right? Uh, so I had to be honest with myself. And I think in the, you know, when talking about being honest and transparent, one of the things that crept up on me was some burnout from, from my in-court work. And so I knew that's what drove me and my colleagues were, were so great um, and the work was great, but I really had to pause and ask myself a few questions and they weren't, they were uncomfortable questions. Um, am I still able to give at this level, at this rate in this role? Um, and if, and if I'm, if I don't think I'm able to give in this role, what else am I curious about? Where can I give? Because I didn't want to be depleted. And I think I saw a question, um, in the chat about self, uh, care and practicing self care. And I think that's part of it. I felt way too young to be asking myself these questions, but I think that's, that was a good life lesson to learn is that, um, burnout isn't a specific age. Right. And so, um, I asked myself those questions. I asked myself, what am I curious about? And is there um, an option or professional development step within my world that can allow me to explore that? Um, and I was coming up a little short. Um, and then I thought about what other things drove my work. Um, when I was at Legal Action a few years in, I also um, was thinking about my time as a student at Marquette and at UW Law and how little I knew about legal action. And it is the state sort of um, federally funded civil legal aid firm um, that covers most of the state and provides free legal services. And so that really concerned me. So I helped start an internship uh, program at legal action. And I worked with um, Marquette undergrads, actually, which was super rewarding and super cool. Um, you know, being in Milwaukee, I thought, you know, students should know that we're here and students should be able to access contacts here, right? Talking about um, not knowing any lawyers when I was at Marquette, not knowing any law students. Um, so I thought that would be a great opportunity. So I created um, an internship um, pipeline program with Marquette. And so uh, that was one of the things I looked forward most in my job is providing that meaningful mentorship with the students we took on every semester. And so um, I think that was another factor of why I transitioned to working with students and uh, sort of the, the combining advocacy and creativity and working with students um, 
sort of all kind of led me back to Marquette. And I, and I think, you know, I never, th I honestly didn't have the thought of ever working at Marquette <laughs> when I was practicing law. Um, but the opportunity popped up and I, you know, the more I spoke with Amelia about um, how the honors program has changed over the past few years, really impressed me. I mean, there's always room to grow and, and, you know, but um, when I was um, an honors student at Marquette, great experience, but it looked a lot different. It felt a lot different than I think the programming um, is and sort of the, the framework we're using for the honors program feels now. And so um, I thought what better way to kind of make that full circle, giving back to students, what was sort of in an institution that so served as my springboard of um, my life here in Wisconsin. So thanks for the question. Thanks so much for sharing that, Sophia. It's cool to see how you've been able to use a similar set of skills and like all these different roles that you've played um, and how it's been able to connect your values to throughout that. So that's neat to see. We're excited to have you at Marquette. Um, so Jalen in the chat has asked the question of what is it like majoring in philosophy and how has the major impacted the ways in which you see life, people, or situations? Um, and Leah, since you were also philosophy, I'm curious if you'd wanna take this question. That is such a good question. And as a philosophy major, I really would like to think about that before I respond. But because this is a live conversation, I get to just sort of say the first thing, I guess, that pops into my head. But what popped into my head is this, the sticky note that was on the folder that was given to me when I graduated from the philosophy program. And I remember it was this navy blue folder. I probably still have it upstairs somewhere. And on the front of the folder, there was just a sticker that said, the examined life. And it came from that quote that was some famous philosopher said it, you know, the unexamined life is not worth living. And so that idea of having an examined life, an intentional life, a life where you can really be critical of the decisions you're making and not sort of be, um, you know, carried about and pulled about in this way and then that way based on what other people are telling you to do or based on your latest kind of desire or based on, you know, whatever. It, it's this sort of uh, intentional cultivation of the people and work and ideas um, in, in your life. That's to me what, what I've taken from the philosophy degree. Um, I, you know, with much stress to my parents, like <laughs> went with the philosophy degree also paired it um, with a journalism degree, which is not a lucrative path either, you know? So um, I, I feel very lucky to have been able to, you know, have, have patched it together financially, like up until this point, you know, where there, it, it, it's neither of those were paths that I followed kind of for the money or for um, uh, anything except for like my true interest. So I feel very, very lucky and, and um, it's a privilege to be able to you know, make those kinds of choices and, and stick with it. Thank you, Leah. Um, Hari, I'm going to go back to the question about the think tanks that I he see here um, from Keely in the chat. You did um, touch on this a little bit, but if you could expand a little bit more of um, what was your experience working with, uh, what is and has been your experience working with think tanks and do you have any advice for students on um, like what, how they should prepare themselves for that experience? Yeah, definitely. So, uh, so my, overall my experience has been really good. I think a lot of it's like when, if you work at a think tank, cause it's not like a big corporation or anything like that, most likely you're gonna have, be work, you're gonna be working under someone really, really closely. For me, I've always been lucky like that. It's either a senior scholar or a research assistant and just how you cultivate that relationship matters a lot because so from my, like I said, my former boss at Hudson, even today, me and him are close, like I'm probably making another trip back to DC for just a bit for training and we already made plans like, okay, you know, I'm going to get some beers while we're there. Um, but like also sounds like, you know, they have a lot of experience, they have a lot of connections. It's just like always just interesting because like you're going to be working with them, you're going to be working with them. So hopefully if they're good people, like they can be really great mentors and like they can make a huge difference in like how your experience experiences and like honestly like my former boss uh even though me and him disagreed on a lot of stuff he always consistently challenged me in a way it's like okay i need to maybe think about this a little bit more and i think like that's like a big thing of like learning how to i think i always make jokes like you know you think in undergrad you know how to like write about things think about things but it's not until you get to like actually applying it that 
you realize like, oh, like this is how much you've been prepared for, but like you actually, it's not, you don't really know until you actually get into the, start doing it for actual living. Um, sorry, what was the second part of the question? I'm forgetting. I think you touched on it. It was like, uh, what are some ways that students can be prepared to work in think tanks? Yeah, definitely just like um, informational interviews, uh, keep in touch with people, and also just make sure like you know what the landscape's like. So like, I think like there's a couple people, like so funny enough with some of my interns here at Car Center, where like asked me about DC and they're interested like, oh, like, oh, like what's the job, what's the job situation like? And I was like, okay, like, well, this is how the think tank situation is like, which is what she was interested in. And when we're talking, I was like, okay, what do you know about the think tanks? Like, what do they, what do they do? What do they specialize in? What's their approach and philosophy to things? And, you know, at the time, of course, she didn't know. It's like, you know, the first thing you should do is like, look it up. Is this something that you could be comfortable with? Is there someone like there that you really want to int interested in? And like, that's like, just kind of knowing like, once you start doing that, you learn about, a little bit about the landscape, whether it be like the think tank world in DC or the nonprofit or working on the Hill or that. And then once you get to DC, especially, or any other city, you'll start learning more of like the stereotypes or like everything like that. So for instance, like the stereotypes, people like to make fun of like think tank people for being nerds, which we are. And usually everybody just makes fun of the people on the Hill for being one of the future politicians. And it's like, yeah, but it's really cool, cool connections. And so just kind of go out there and just meet people, meet people. And plus, happy hour is a big thing in DC, so take advantage of that. Thanks, Hari. Mallory, uh, earlier you shared that you have had experience both doing service after graduation as well as directing a program. Uh, what is one tip that you would have for students who are considering potentially doing a service year after they graduate? That's a good question. Um, I. I think that the discernment process for doing a year of service should you should take really seriously because you're um, signing up usually for a year, possibly two years, depending on the program, um, where most likely there are some programs where you're just um, not just, but you're working full time at a nonprofit. And then there are other programs where you're working full time at a nonprofit and living in intentional community outside of that. And that's a huge commitment that I think a lot of people don't really take that seriously. They just think that they're going to do one of these programs, have a great full-time job, and then have four roommates that they live with. But really there are um, structures, different structures for every single program out there that might incorporate spirituality, that might incorporate community development, that might incorporate simple living, living off very few funds every single month, um, and trying to kind of um, think about lowering your impact on the earth. And so that can intrigue a lot of different people, but it can also pose a lot of unforeseen challenges. So um, my recommendation would just be to find people who are participating in the program or have participated in the program that you're considering and ask them a lot of very detailed questions about what their day-to-day -day looks like and what some of the challenges are. Um, I think a lot of people experience a lot of benefits doing a year of service, um, but there are some definite challenges that are unique to the post-grad service experience that don't come up for your friends or colleagues who are working in an entry level position and don't have that added layer of doing an intentional service program at the same time. Thanks, Mallory. Sophia, Gracie's asking, um, what are you most proud of in your career? Thanks, Gracie. I think, um, I mean, I, I, I don't know if I said this, but I recently joined Marquette just this semester. So I think we have a lot to go, but in terms of, um, in my career so far, I mean, I think it does have to be um, the work that the Eviction Defense Project does, and that's much larger than me. Um, you know, it's a small part in that, but I think the 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 work that the project does. I mean, we, you know, Milwaukee County um, uh, sees about fourteen thousand evictions every year, uh, eviction cases, and um, it's 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 just like a whole. Um, really dark um, and really unsettling world. And, and it's right in our backyards, right? Um, it's either happening in court or it's happening in communities where 
someone says leave and they leave um, and they don't go through the formal process. And we saw that a lot in Milwaukee, particularly in the South side of Milwaukee um, and in trying to engage uh, Latinx community here. So, um, so yeah, I think that the, just um, the colleagues that I've had the privilege of working with um, and what drives them and sort of the resources that they pour into that work in preventing evictions, but not just having it there at the individual level, right? I think it's um, a lot of us, I think are pretty cognizant and curious about overall structures that feed into um, oppression in our in our society, right? So um, not only, I think the program and the people I worked with were not only focused on preventing an eviction for this family or preventing an eviction for this person, but really being intentional about um, the fact that most of the people that the Milwaukee County Courthouse sees who are facing eviction are at the cusp of not being able to afford safe and secure housing, right? And that can be said for cities across our nation. And it's people who got an unexpected medical bill and that they could barely afford rent with or without this eviction summons, right? So we're not, you know, our our part is so small. And we actually worked with journalism uh, journalists um, in Milwaukee who really wanted to cover um, topics like that. So I think it's a whole network and lawyers are just a part of it, um, but that would be sort of the, I think one of the most um, proudest things I've been part of, um, not necessarily done on my own. Um, and sort of also thinking about community lawyering and helping people become empowered and not coming in and saving the day, right? But coming in after hearing from that community, after being a part of that community, right? Um, and helping um, others feel empowered with the knowledge and resources that you know they didn't have access to um, now go on to their community and other communities. And um, you know that's sort of how that gets lifted. So. Yeah, thanks for the question. Thanks, Sophia. I see that we have five minutes left. Um, so I'm going to have one last question for all the panelists to share um, to share on. So we can start off with Leah. What is one piece of advice that you have for students who wanna make a positive difference with their career, but just don't know where to start? Yeah, that's such a good question. And I think it's repeating a lot of what everyone has said here tonight, find your community. I can't emphasize enough the need to have a community of practice around whatever it is you're doing, because um, as kind of bright and exciting as the world seems, you know, and really is at this point of, you know, exiting college and entering kind of the rest of your life, if you're thinking about leaving education for, you know, an undefined scope of time, you know, um, it also will get hard. And so I think, you know, I've certainly relied on my community, my network of, of friends and colleagues when things have gotten tough. Um, and, it, and in return, you know, that community will need you one day. And so my advice would be, you know, really underscoring what has been said here, get to know as many people as you can, really be genuinely interested and concerned for them and, and curious about what they're doing, because you never know when you'll need that connection or vice versa and kind of where that will go. So really the relational aspect and, and building a community around whatever it is you're doing, because no one can do it alone. Um, no one can do it alone. Thanks, Leah, that's great advice. Hari? Yeah, so I guess like kind of even two part answers. One, like whatever you do, whether make sure you're passionate about it. And it might seem like kind of like dull, but I can guarantee you if you don't do something that you're passionate about, even if you do something you're passionate about, you're going to have days where you're feeling really down, where you feel like you're not doing a good job. If you're doing something that you're not passionate about or you do not care about, it's going to feel like that all the time, all the time, and you never want to get back in, get back into it. So whenever you can, like if you have the opportunity to do something that you actually care about, that you're passionate for, do it because that that's the place that you know you'll want to keep coming back to, no matter how bad it might get. That's something that you want to excel in, and that's what you think is actually making a difference for you. And also, kind of tying in Patrick's question. That he asked a while back because like make sure whatever you do whatever you do do practice self-care self-care i know definitely i did not develop good self-care habits while i was in marquette it took me till like i was I, while well, i was adult in marquette but like, i guess like more of an adult afterwards and was like going like okay like definitely like all the stuff i thought i could do in undergrad like oh i could just work 20 hours right no one's going to care and they get four hours of sleep obviously nah, i learned that the hard way and i had some time where carson where i'm just passed out because like oh i did not sleep enough last night but also just mentally it's like it's going to be hard whether you do like in national politics like me it's like you're going to 
be studying a lot of stuff that involves death, involves conflict, involves war. And like oftentimes me, I get to see it on video. So make sure you make sure you keep yourself where they be have community or just little hobbies on the side that have nothing to do with it. That's really important. So like, yeah, passion and self-care. Yeah, thanks, Hari. That's been really important for me too. Hobbies, like exploring hobbies beyond graduation can be so fun and exciting. Thank you. Mallory? Uh, yeah, definitely echo what Leah and Hari have said. Um, I think the only thing I want to add is just like get curious about the world and let your interests drive you because that's how you find out what you're passionate about. It's how you find out what you're good at. And by that, I mean, like, where do your skills intersect with the needs of the world? And um, if you're just like a curious person who is interested in getting to know people, interested in getting to know different sets of beliefs, different worldviews, like I was talking about earlier, um, you'll be on a path where you can kind of take in so much and then learn, you know, what feels good to work on for you. And you'll know the feeling when you have it, you might have already had it. And that's awesome if you have, but if you haven't, don't worry, like just keep exploring. And at some point you will like be at a crossroads where, where you'll know like, okay, this is the issue that I want to work on. And these are the contributions that I can make. Um, so just get curious. That's my, that's my tagline. <laughs> Thanks, Mallory. Sophia. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll try to keep this brief since we're coming against time, but I think that all the, you know, community, passion, curiosity, I think that that all fits the Jesuit framework too of, of learning. And, um, I love hearing those answers. I agree with all of it. I think even attending something like this, like all of you are attending this, um, we're going to be available if you wanted to reach out to a particular person on the panel for follow-up questions. I think, again, getting to know people in the field that you might be curious in doesn't doesn't limit you, right? It doesn't commit you to anything, but um, asking questions I think is, is so important. And then just um, lastly, I think using Marquette as a vehicle for that exploration, right? I think that we have majors and minors and programs and we have these categories and labels for a reason, but I think the more interdisciplinary you want to get, the more sort of across the aisle you want to get, um, I think, you know, we're here to help you make that, um, uh, to help you realize that and to help you sort of actualize that path. Um, I know within the honors program, um, you know, we encourage that and we're here to, to help students um, become sort of empowered and take ownership of their own academic path. And if it doesn't look like it works on paper, we will probably be able to make it work for you. Um, and I think that's so important for students in navigating this, uh, this um, discernment process. Thanks so much, Sophia. Thanks everyone for joining us tonight. Um, uh, we will be sending a follow-up email tomorrow with the email addresses of all of our panelists. So if you have follow-up questions, you're welcome to reach out. I want to um, thank all of our panelists for being here with us tonight. It's been really insightful for myself to hear from you all. And I hope that the students on the call um, also feel the same way. It is, it's really important for us to have these conversations to, to make these connections um, because we are a Marquette community and um, it is it has been exciting for me to lean on alum. And so we're really grateful for your presence tonight. So thank you. I am going to um, go ahead and end the stream, but if there are folks who wanna stick around um, and chat a little bit right um, after this, you're welcome to, but for those who um, have to head out, thank you again for being with us today. It's been great to be a part of this program with you. Thanks everyone. Have a nice night. Thanks for having us. Thanks. Yeah, yeah thank you for organizing. Yeah, thank you. Bye.